This week on Vaticano, meet Father Bernardo Cervellera as he gives us a look inside the Catholic Church in China as the country celebrates the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On July the 1st, Beijing marked 100 years of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, also known as the CCP. The week was a giant celebration of concerts, galas, and rallies, with singing and dancing to honor their past. Chinese President Xi Jinping delivered an hour-long speech to 70,000 people, praising their achievement of becoming one of the world's largest economic powers. But these so-called achievements were not voluntary. The Chinese people are under strict surveillance by their own government to ensure their lives are in line with the teachings of the CCP. And that includes the Catholic Church. On October the 22nd, 2020, China and the Vatican extended their provisional agreement to jointly appoint Catholic bishops, leaving room for Pope Francis' blessing. But experience is showing that that agreement didn't change China's disregard for religious freedom. Father Bernardo Cervellera, a missionary with the Pontifical Institute for Foreign Missions and former head of Asia News Press Agency, is an expert on the church in China. Catholic News Agency's Rome correspondent, Courtney Mares, sat down with him before he embarked on his new mission in Hong Kong. Now it's been nearly three years since the Holy See signed an agreement with Chinese authorities, often referred to as the Vatican-China deal. Can you tell us a little bit about what the situation is like in China right now on the ground um, for these Chinese Catholic communities? The situation is very harsh. The official community uh, has a certain uh, freedom of uh, uh, worship means that now they can do some masses uh, because they have, they, there, have been, there has been um, one year under the COVID emergencies in which the churches were closed. But now they are starting again to reopen. Uh, the point is that uh, they have to sign a paper in which they promise to support the Communist Party in China. They cannot evangelize, they cannot pray, they cannot do anything. And above all, they have to praise the glory of the Communist Party. This year in which uh, the Communist Party of China is celebrating its 100th uh, uh, anniversary of its foundation, every community, every diocese have done congresses, uh, performances, uh, uh, theaters, uh, and even pilgrimages to the places of uh, uh, the Communist Party history. But they have forbidden to go to uh, pilgrimage to Our Lady of Sheshan, which is the, the sanctuary, uh, the national sanctuary for Our Lady in, uh, in China. Yes, so can you help us to understand what were the circumstances that led the, uh, the Vatican to enter into an agreement with China in the first place? Pope Francis would like to go to China. In fact, uh, that is, uh, the, the, the Vatican was looking for a relationship with China since uh, Paul VI, uh, since John Paul II. John Paul II wrote to Deng Xiaoping uh, uh, Benedict XVI tried to have a relationship with them, but uh, without, uh, uh, without success. The point is that after three years, we have, we have seen the freedom of religion reduced to, uh, for the Catholic Church in China and also for the, other, for the other religions. Because in China, the church uh, needs at least 40 bishops, 40 new bishops. So even from this aspect, it's, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say a failure, but we are near to a failure. And what do you make about the possibility of a papal trip to China? Do you think it would be a good thing for the country? It was and it is the dream, one of the dream of Pope Francis. I doubt that it, it can be possible. I doubt it because uh, the point is that uh, in reality uh, the agreement between the Vatican and China 
is an agreement between the foreign ministry, the Chinese foreign ministry, and the Vatican. The point is that these two, they agree on something, but uh, the life of the church in China belongs to the Patriotic Association and to the United Front, which belongs to the Communist Party. But the foreign ministry doesn't have any influence on the United Front. So practically, in some way, the Pope, even if he is recognized as uh, uh, the chief of the Catholic Church, doesn't have any influence on the situation of the church in China, because the situation of the church in China uh, is under the control of the United Front. And the United Front, in uh, these uh, years, has always stressed the fact that the church in China must be independent. Independent means independent also uh, from the Pope. And we've all had a tough year with the coronavirus pandemic, and Chinese Catholics are already living under a lot of restrictions. How did uh, the COVID-19 pandemic affect Chinese Catholic communities? It affects them very, very deeply because uh, they couldn't meet, they couldn't, uh, uh, they couldn't work, and also the churches were the last, the last buildings and the last uh, operational places which were open. There is one positive aspect, that is uh, the government allowed uh, the Catholic communities and other uh, religious communities to have uh, rites and prayers by internet, uh, virtual uh, prayer and virtual masses, which is uh, in some way forbidden by the uh, regulation, the religious regulation. But in the period of the COVID, uh, of the, of the COVID they allowed it to do it. And this made uh, the, the community um, more united. Now you covered Asia as a journalist for the past two decades, and you were able to report of violations of religious freedom, not only just for Christians, but for people of all faiths, including the Uyghurs in China. And given what we know about the current situation in Xinjiang, do you, are you, do you have concerns about the future for other ethnic and religious minorities in China? Sure. It is all religions in China are controlled. This is uh, uh, the fear of the Communist Party, that people can be free. The terrible uh, situation of Uyghur is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is real, because uh, it is an accusation made by Muslims, Uyghur, who, who have fled, uh, fled from Xinjiang, from, by the United, United Nations, by, the other, by other nations in the world. And I met once a, a person, a Uyghur, who talked to me about uh, the situation of his family in Xinjiang, uh, the death of uh, his brother in uh, one of these, uh, of these uh, lager camp, lager camp. Uh, really very, very sad and very tragic, very tragic. All the religions are always in, uh, in danger because uh, every human power uh, tries to cancel religions because uh, a man wants to be a powerful man, uh, wants to be God in some way. And Chinese President Xi Jinping has been promoting this policy in which he calls the Sinonization mm -hmm. of religion in China. Can you explain what that means for, for Catholic practice in China? Sinicization um, is a, a slogan uh, in which uh, Xi Jinping, since 2015, I think, uh, said that if the religions in China, they don't sinicize, it's impossible for them to live in China. They will be uh, cancelled uh, from China. It is a nationalistic way to uh, understand religion. It is, religions should uh, express their faith, should, should express their architectural uh, places and so on in the, Chinese, uh, in the Chinese way. In some way, this is uh, right. 
And this, uh, for, for example, the church has done in all these centuries. The churches were built with the Chinese characteristics. Uh, the, the, the dress of the priests also was changed, and so on. In some way, uh, Sinicization is an expression of uh, um, inculturation. It means that uh, the Catholic Church should try to express uh, her faith in the culture of the people in which she lives. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano starts now. Now you've worked as a, a journalist during three pontificates, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Pope Francis. What similarities and differences have you observed in how these three different popes have approached China? With John Paul II, I think one of the most important uh, attempt to reach China was in the uh, World Youth Day in Manila in 1995, in which John Paul II said that Asia is our common mission for the third millennium. No. And uh, um, youth from China were invited, and they uh, started uh, celebrating uh, the masses and uh, the meeting with the, with the other youth in, uh, in Manila. Uh, Benedict XVI and also John Paul II did a very good job reconciling all the bishops, all the official bishops who had been nominated by the Communist Party and John Paul II and Benedict XVI, they accepted them into the Catholic Church through a letter that these bishops were writing, uh, asking for pardon for their situation. And this was very important because with Benedict XVI in 2007, <coughs> practically all the bishops in China were related with the, with the Pope. So there was a, practically a, un, a united uh, church in China in 2007, when Benedict XVI wrote that wonderful letter to the Catholic, to the Chinese Catholics uh, uh, in 2007, that uh, even Pope, uh, Pope Francis says that uh, it, is, uh, it has still an important value. And in fact, it is uh, quite balanced in uh, stressing the freedom of religion's rights and the right of the government to govern also the church. Pope Francis uh, has tried to have this relationship and has found this very minimal relationship uh, with, the, with the agreement. In Benedict XVI's letter to China, he discusses the importance of ongoing formation of priests. Um, what do we know about the state of, of formation of priests and as well as vocations? Is the current situation encouraging vocations or is that something that's discouraging them? In China uh, nowadays uh, there are problems first of all because of the demography because nowadays all Chinese families all Catholic Chinese families they feel uh, the, the question of uh, the one-child policy uh, which lasted for more than 30 years so now the families have one child and it is difficult for them to, uh, uh, to give to God uh, this, this child, because also they need to know what to do when they are old. And so vocations from, um, some priests told me, vocations are reduced now, not, not a, a big number com a, as before. Formation also has become difficult, not because uh, there are not seminaries, but because uh, 
these seminaries, they are always controlled. So, for example, some aspect, uh, social doctrine of the church is not taught, or some part of the social doctrine of the church are not taught. And I'm curious to hear more about your time living in Beijing, as well as during your frequent um, trips to China over the years. Um, how did you find kind of the average Chinese person that you encountered? What was their knowledge or curiosity about the gospel and, and also the Catholic Church? I've always found a very deep religious sense in many young people. And in fact, university students, they, uh, they are very interested in, uh, um, in Catholicism and in Christianity also. Protestant Christianity. Uh, I think this is why uh, the government, the Chinese government now tries to stop the religious education for youth because uh, they uh, fear uh, an increase of uh, uh, this, of an increase of the conversions. But uh, the point is that the Chinese people, they are a very religious people. And in fact, uh, their conversions are always there. And John Paul II described Asia as the mission for the church in the third millennium. How do you feel that the church is doing in this mission? I think there is a, a kind of vision that the church and the, the College of Cardinals should be more international because up to now it has become, it has always been uh, Italians, Europeans, American, perhaps, uh, but now there are more, uh, more Asians. I think the, the Western church or the other churches in the world, they should learn from Asia, from the churches in Asia, two things. One, to be a minority, which means that perhaps they cannot change the situation immediately because they don't have the political power. But being a minority, this means to be a more clear witness. And in fact, what strikes me when I, when I live in, uh, in Asia is that these Catholics are very decided in their faith. They don't have fear. They, even if they are a minority, they are full of courage. They, they, are uh, full of, in, of creativity to find ways to evangelize people, to help people, to support uh, uh, situations of poverty or uh, uh, children or, or something like this. Really something very, very admiring. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. We're speaking now in Rome just before you return to Hong Kong to start the next chapter in your missionary journey. And Hong Kong is a city that's changed so much um, since you were last there. How, how is the city of Hong Kong different now than even just, say, a few years ago? Now, uh, no uh, meeting is allowed uh, with more than four people. No uh, uh, expression is allowed that stresses the value of Hong Kong compared with China. No, no critics to China is allowed because if not, you are, you are accused of being terrorist. So uh, I think that nowadays uh, the situation of Hong Kong has become as somebody uh, told me is uh, a desert of opinion, of silence. Also the church has been uh, in some way divided between uh, those who supported democracy and those who were more cautious, more silent, 
saying that uh, better to cooperate with China, not to mm, make any fuss. Uh, and so the youth, they feel they have been betrayed by, by, the, by the church. The situation also is very, is very difficult, but this is why it is very important there could be witnesses of faith and of hope in this situation. This is why I go to, China, to, to Hong Kong. And could you tell us a little bit, going back, how you first found your vocation with the Pontifical Institute for Foreign Missions? Mamma mia. <laughs> I was uh, very simple. It is, uh, in my youth, being 17 years old, um, uh, I was uh, a Maoist. In Italy, there was a lot of uh, demonstrations, uh, desire to change the society, 1968, no? Uh, and so I was uh, um, excited by Maoism and by the, the plans of the new society. But then I saw that uh, people who were supporting Maoism, they were also, they were also very violent towards uh, women and towards uh, other colleagues. So I detached myself. And so I started to try to find somebody who could uh, forgive the, the, the mistakes, the, the violence, to could forgive human beings. And this is the only the, the possibility of uh, Jesus Christ. And so I returned to my Catholic faith. My return was so exciting that I decided to give all my life to evangelization. After I finished my studies uh, at university, at the Catholic University in Milan, uh, I met some Pime missionaries. I read uh, um, a book by Henri de Lubac, uh, a, a great theologian. Uh, he says uh, that uh, if God is eliminated, then also the human being is eliminated. And so this means that uh, in atheist societies, human beings suffer most. And this I have discovered uh, visiting China and uh, staying with Chinese people. And uh, to give this hope to the Chinese people is worthwhile. So this is why it's good to go to China as missionary. Yes, and lastly, after so much suffering, what can we, the church, do to help the situation of persecuted Christians in China? There are two things uh, which, which we can do. One is uh, to pray, to pray for China. It is very strange, the fact that uh, John Paul, uh, no, uh, Benedict XVI uh, inaugurated the World Day of Prayer for the Church in China on the 24th of May of every year, but not many dioceses uh, celebrate this. Instead, uh, it is important, it is important. Let us say, uh, we talk about, uh, a lot about uh, the new Silk Road, but the real Silk Road is the, the, the prayer uh, road, the road of prayer, the road of pilgrimage. Because this can change China better, better. So the pray prayer, first of all. The second is to try to express our unity uh, towards our, our um, brothers and sisters in China. The political powers, what they fear is our unity. Very well said. Thank you so much, Father. We'll be praying for China and we'll also be praying for you as you head out on your mission. Thank you very much. Much needed. <laughs>